Now we're going to um, kind of switch gears kind of back to the medical aspects. And um, certainly as a physician, um, this is the area that I am the most uh, uh, concerned about uh, and, and probably have the least amount of answers for my families. And so, uh, and it is the area that we're working really hard to get better answers uh, for our families. So we're gonna start off with a, a, a review of um, some radiologic features uh, that will um, probably help solidify some of the things that Dr. Hess talked about. Finish with a, uh, a lecture on some of the neurologic issues that we have seen in face and then um, hopefully spend a lot of time answering all the questions. So unfortunately for Dr. O'Connor and Dr. Johnson, most of the questions that we received were regarding some of these issues because it's such an such a, a important issue with very little information. So with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Craig Johnson. He is a pediatric interventional radiologist. He's also new to our hospital. Um, we we uh, were lucky enough to recruit him from um, his uh, fellowship at uh, Boston's Children's Hospital and um, he's just been a huge uh, addition and finally somebody that's as energetic as I am, I think. Uh, so it's really um, nice to have that and he's fit well into the team and uh, let's give a big hand for him to come in. Thank you. Thank you very much, Beth. Um, please let me know if you are able, if I'm talking too loud, too soft, if you're able to, to hear me okay. Um, and thanks to, again, uh, you've heard it so many times, all the, the families uh, coming and, and to all the speakers for such an important uh, topic. And I think it really, for me, um, as an interventional radiologist who treats a number of different um, syndromes and different vascular anomalies, I, I think it, this community really sets an example. So I named the, the talk today um, Imaging of Face Syndrome 101 to kind of go back to the basics and go through some of the different imaging that probably many of you have already gone through and to talk about kind of the pros and cons of each. So first of all, I know some of my uh, colleagues have done this and it gets very confusing. It's confusing to, to radiologists much. I can't imagine how confusing it is to everybody else. So, so what is everybody? And quickly, um, a neuroradiologist does five years of training, which includes, uh, that's the diagnostic, that's their general radiology, which includes at least six months of neuroradiology, which is a lot of what we've talked about and include in a lot of our, our research for face, and then additionally about six months of IR. However, they have an additional one to three years, depending on the institution and depending if they actually do the interventional component in a combination of adult and child brain, face, and spine imaging. And the background is variable. So if you have two different people, you certainly could have two different backgrounds. The pediatric, vascular, and interventional radiologist, that's way too long of a term, so a lot of times you'll just hear IR. And for us, we have the same beginning where you have approximately well, five years with six months of IR and six months of neuroradiology. That's the average. Every different university is different. And then you have to finish two additional fellowships uh, in adult and child interventional radiology. Some people do a year of adult, a year of child, and some just concentrate on children. And that's what, what I did. I don't treat any of the uh, adult diseases. and. Um, also the diagnostic imaging, which includes the, the neuroradiology. So sometimes it can be do, good to do a, a little of everything. Sometimes it leads to uh, many sleepless nights. So, and definitely variable backgrounds. So objectives for today, first of all, to discuss the different imaging modalities that are used to image face, and also to, to understand what the pros and cons and strengths of each of those are, to discuss some of the advantages and disadvantages, and also to discuss what we do here at, at Children's of Wisconsin and what our rationale is behind our approach. First of all, the, the oldest of all the modalities, the x-ray. And as you may or may not know, many of, of your children probably have had x-rays, but it has no significant role in face imaging and looking at the specific aspects of the syndrome that Dr. Hess discussed yesterday. It's a 2D image which is made by x-rays passing through the body. The easiest way that I can explain it to families is typically if you're standing out in the sun 
especially sunrise or sunset, you look behind you and you see a shadow, that's exactly what an x-ray is. And the shadow is just a permanent imprint of what you see as the shadow and making it into a black and white image. It does have a small amount of radiation and as you know as imagers we're very concerned these days about radiation exposure to the children and making sure that always it's as low as possible. And like I said a picture of shadows. So some of the heart findings that we can see in face are suggested on these shadow images or x-rays especially if the heart's on the right side or if there's a right aortic arch but the vast majority of the findings aren't specific. They can just give us a hint that we need to look a little bit further. And that may be helpful more to outside institutions that don't see this every day. But certainly when I see a patient coming from Beth, I already usually have the history and know what I need to be looking for. So usually we'll, we'll have a different imaging approach that we'll talk about in a little bit. And some people talk about the sternal findings, and that's not something that's well seen on x-ray. A lot of the sternum is actually cartilage, like your ear or your nose, and the x-rays do not show those shadows well at all. So this is uh, just an example of an x-ray, and I'm not gonna quiz anybody in the room, but the little round thing here is usually on the left side, and that's your aorta, and on this side, it's on the right. So that should clue any radiologist into saying we need to look at the heart a little bit further because there is an association with underlying developmental heart anomalies. Next is ultrasound, which probably many of you are familiar with and maybe all of you have had. It has a limited role in the imaging of the neuroimaging, especially of the brain and spine outside of the neonatal period. In the right hands, it can be extremely valuable in the neonatal period or, as we were talking about before, before the neonatal period for obstetrics. It also has a very major role in cardiac imaging and classification. Important thing to remember is no radiation is used, so we certainly like this and we're constantly working on the, the technology of being able to get more and more information out of ultrasound and certainly that technology is progressing as MRI and CT is also progressing. And certainly our recommendation and probably most of the children have had uh, echoes or ultrasound of the heart and one of the really nice things about ultrasound is that many times we don't need to do sedation. And a lot of times with the MRI and the CT, we don't do sedation either, but most of the time we do. And at our institution here, typically less than 30 days, we'll do the feed and wrap. The younger the babies are, the more predictable it is that once they, they have the milk or the formula, then they're gonna actually stay still for a little bit. And that's obviously highly variable. And as you get more and more months old, and every institution is different on how many months they'll try it up to, um, that they'll actually just go straight to sedation. Usually they can just do the ultrasound over the chest wall. They don't need to put the ultrasound or the camera down the throat, but that's the other way of actually taking ultrasound images of the heart. And then here, once they're greater than two years of age, we'll usually try, obviously they don't stay real still, but, um, but we're able to, to deal with that. It's not like an MRI where one twitch will ruin the next five minutes um, for ultrasound. It's more of a live image. The benefit is not only do we get static images like pictures on the wall, but we also get movie clips. And those movie clips we call cine clips, but they're actually, we can watch the heart beating. We can watch the arteries pulsating. And that's very helpful because, as you can imagine, if I'm uh, covering the ultrasound service for a day, we'll have four or five ultrasounds going on in our hospital at one time. And I can't be doing all four or five ultrasounds. So it's a way for me to see what the sonographer saw. And then for the difficult cases, obviously, I go in and redo the ultrasound. But, um, but not being able to be everywhere, this is very helpful. 3D imaging, we were just talking about that before the break, and 3D imaging and 4D imaging are the wave of the future and the wave of the present in obstetrics. And certainly, I know when, uh, when I just had our first uh, son about a year ago, we got all kinds of um, little mail, uh, snail mail about coming to 
one clinic and, and getting a 3D picture, find out what your baby is going to look like. There was a lot of advertisements for, like in the mall over in Boston, they would, they would have a number of places to go get it done. These weren't medical facilities, these were purely for, for cosmetic to put on the, on the refrigerator. And that's pretty much today, in, in the obstetric world, we use that information, sometimes not for medical reasons, sometimes for medical reasons. Once the baby is born, we don't use 3 imaging as of today. And it's highly variable, the quality of that. It's all gonna be depend on where the baby's position is. And as I was talking about before, they're always moving around in there. And obviously all the mothers here can talk about how they feel the baby moving around in there. Um, another thing that's very nice is if the baby's born and very sick, one of you were talking before about how it was only 12 hours before there, there was a cardiac event and they needed to, to have immediate intervention. Obviously, we can't move that MRI machine to the ICU and we can't move the CT machine to the ICU. But what we can do, the ultrasound machine is maybe 500 pounds, something like that, and it's on wheels. So we can usually get that into an elevator and fit it into the, into the ICU room and get quite a bit of information and more information if they're young. This is an example of just a, a picture of a random echocardiogram. And as you can see, Our mouse is, uh, our battery is going down, so. As you can see here, you can get information on flow and it's linked to the, to the actual EKG, so you can see when the heart is actually beating and you can actually watch the heart beat. So the next thing that you can see, can you see blood vessels? Because a lot of times, obviously, we're talking a lot about blood vessels in this conference, and that's certainly one of the, one of the things we look at very, very close in face syndrome on the imaging side. And we certainly can see blood vessels. We take advantage of the fact, as I was talking before, we can't see through bone and we can't see through air, but we have the advantage of those soft spots when the baby is born. And this is an, this is an example here of the midline image, kind of looking from the, the side of the face through the ear. And these are the, the blood vessels. This is actually the carotid here, and this is the anterior cerebral artery coming around. This is obviously nowhere close to the resolution that would be necessary to talk about stenosis, but we can see flow in it at least. So you can see areas that don't have flow and where you need to actually move on to additional imaging, and we use that commonly for that. This is something that's done only usually at specialized pediatric ultrasound centers, and this is the mastoid view. Just behind the baby's ear, there's actually another tiny soft spot that most people don't know about. And if you put the camera there, you can actually get a CT image of the, what we call the posterior fossa. And I know Dr. Hess talked about that a little bit yesterday. That's a complex term for, for a number of people, but that's where the cerebellum lives. And as you know, a lot of the abnormalities that we can see in face syndrome involve the cerebellum and maybe not as much the upper part or the cerebral cortex. So this is an image here coming in from the side and this is the cerebellum here. So here's one half, here's the other. And so we always want to see if one is really tiny compared to the other and make sure that all three parts are present. The third part here that should be in the middle the vermis isn't, uh, isn't present on this. So we actually were able to make the diagnosis of a Dandy Walker malformation just from the ultrasound. This is uh, a couple other examples of what it looks like on the mastoid um, view. And just to letting you know some of the information that you can get. So if you do, if you did have a study that said you, you were able to see that one cerebellar hemisphere was smaller than the other on an ultrasound, some people would be like, you can't see that far, you can't. Now you know that, that you really can, but most places don't know how to do it accurately. So therefore, what do we do normally at most places? MRI. And here on the MRI, it's always tough to see if you don't have a normal picture next to it. So this was the same patient.
You know what? Do you have that um, laser pointer? Is it? Okay, it's, it's letting me work for a second here. Um, so the posterior fossa, this is what it should look like here with two same size. And here, you can see they're very small and there's all the extra white stuff here. So CT is the next thing I want to talk about. CAT scans, everybody knows them as CAT scans. And what that is, is a, is a big donut. I don't know how many of you or your children have had CAT scans, but there's certainly pros and cons to each of the imaging modalities. And CAT scans are also x-rays, many x-rays, that spin in a circle around you and take pictures from different angles. Um, that's the reason why it's a big round donut, is because it's actually spinning inside of you. And I know that, not inside of you, around you, hopefully not inside <laughs> of you. Not yet at least, maybe in the future. Um, it's, it's a larger space than an MRI, so we have a lot less problems with claustrophobic patients. Uh, usually that's more teenagers and, and small, smaller children, not the babies, they, they don't care as much. And the nice thing also is it's not as loud. For any of you who have been in an MRI scanner, that dum 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 dum, I mean it's, it's tough for, for you if you're inside of there. It's sometimes very tough for us if we're sitting outside. Some of the um, different sequences or pictures that they take, it's almost like the inner part of your ear is, is vibrating and it can be and, and we certainly know that that can happen. Um, X-rays are radiation. Like I said, we, especially at children's medical centers and for pediatric imagers, we're always, always looking for ways to reduce the amount of radiation and make it as small as possible so that the, the, any kind of theoretical risk or real risk is as small as possible for the future. CT is very fast, which is, which is a huge advantage. Why is, it, why is that an advantage? Because a lot of times we don't have to give medicine, put the tube down the throat, give general anesthesia, because within a couple seconds, we can image the entire neck and head. And certainly in, in trauma patients, where they need to know answers very fast and the patient is moving a little bit, we still put them in and actually are able to do the whole body in 10, 15 seconds. There's tons of CAT scans done in the US, and I'm not sure how many in Canada, but I'm sure it's growing there too. 72 million uh, CT scans in 2007 and only rising. However, there were studies in the last year that show if you look in the United States, almost every major children's medical center, the CT volume is going down, down, down. And I know we unfortunately have to keep reducing the size of our department and laying off more people because the amount of CTs is going down so much as the amount of MRIs and ultrasounds go up. So the nice thing about CT as opposed to the x-ray and the shadows that we were talking about is you get 3D information and certainly you've seen some of those pictures yesterday and I'll show you a couple more in a little bit but the, the, uh, they're amazing and the amount of things that the computers and we can do with that information is, is pretty amazing. The spatial resolution, which means how high def, we're talking if it's old school TV, 720, 1080p, how high def it is, is very good. It's, it's probably above the 720 range, but it, it's not the best, but pretty darn close to it. Second only to angiography, and that's the gold standard, but it doesn't come without a cost also, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. You need an IV. An IV isn't fun for us to get. An IV is even less fun for the, the little babies to get. So that's, um, that's one of the downfalls of a, of a CT as opposed to an ultrasound where you don't need to have the IV. But we certainly need the IV because the contrast, the exam is pretty worthless without the contrast. This is just an example of the information that the CAT scan gets originally. So you're looking from the top of the head down and you're actually looking here at the blood vessels. We wouldn't be able to see any of these without contrast. This is all bone. This is part of the jaw. And this is the breathing tube here and here. And as you can see on this side, there's three vessels when there should only be one. This is the normal side. This is the abnormal side. And from that information, all of those slices, the computer is able to rearrange it in many, many different ways. And here, the computer is letting us see it from the side, looking from the ear towards, 
and this is pretty close to the middle, you can see how beautifully we can see all the vessels in the lung here. This is the breathing tube, and then this is actually the vertebral artery, one of those major four arteries that Dr. Hess talked about yesterday. Now, that's a lot of information and gets pretty confusing, so we could actually tell the computer to take away soft tissue, take away bone, take away everything, and just give us the blood vessels. And here, this is what the computer did with that. And you can see here the tortuosity and the curviness of the blood vessel on this side of the body as compared to the other side of the body, and it makes it much easier to see that way. Here's a couple more images demonstrating how we can put the bone back and we can take it away. And some images, in some ways, you can actually see some of the specific details, like here where you have a, one of the carotid arteries that actually is very tortuous and curvy, just like we were talking about over here. And also you might be able to see a little bit more of a subtle finding that the aorta, we were talking about echo and, and how it's able to see some things better than others. A lot of times in, in face syndrome, it's not the aorta going up that's, that's the issue, it's the aorta coming down in the back, the coarctation portion, and you can see how thin this is compared to how thick this is going up. So next I want to talk a little about MRI. And MRI is kind of the gold standard for the soft tissue components, some of the brain imaging that we use and neck imaging. And MRI is filled with very, very, very complex physics, physics that, that most people in the field don't completely understand. And it's probably one of the toughest things to explain to somebody. I think the easiest way to talk about it is I always talk about magnets on the refrigerator and the magnets actually work with water, and as many of you probably know, it's, it's hard to admit sometimes, but we're actually mostly water, and um, some of our body is much more water than other parts of our body. Obviously, you have the blood and the fluid around the brain, and then the bones have a lot less. And depending on how much water is in each area, the magnets can can actually differentiate the different soft tissues and create these amazing images. There's a lot more physics to it than that, but that's about the easiest. Everywhere where there's water in the body, the, the MRI can see that, and it can determine the differences between the two based on how we alter the water molecules. Then we add contrast, and adding contrast, as you know, the contrast goes through an IV, so wherever the blood goes that carries the contrast, the contrast can go. So areas like a hemangioma, which has a lot of blood flow to it, will carry a lot of contrast to it. And therefore, on our images, it'll light up like a light bulb. And that's kind of in a nutshell what we use the contrast for. We can also use it for while it's in the blood vessels on the way somewhere to take a snapshot, and then we can see the arteries too. So those are the two nice benefits of it. Unfortunately, as all of you who have sat there with your children, it can be a very, very long test. It can be up to two hours. Um, certainly with, to get all the imaging that we need, we, we were working together a couple days ago from three different institutions, and the best we could come up with, depending on what kind of machine you have, probably would be an hour and 15 minutes to an hour and 30 minutes to look for everything that we feel we would need to look for in phase syndrome, and that was the bare minimum and that's with good scanners. So it's a lot, it's a long test. The space is very small. I don't know how many of you have climbed up and gone into the MRI scanner yourself. I had to have a couple this year already and um, it's, uh, it's not fun in there. It's pretty, uh, pretty darn small. And they put little mirrors in front of your eyes and you can watch a movie and it, it makes it a little bit easier but I can see how people would get um, claustrophobic. And it's very, very loud, as any of you who have been in there can attest to. Obviously, you have to be very careful with metal around. If you put that into Google, you'll see wheelchairs that flew into the machine. You'll see everything you can, you can imagine that's metal that, that flies around the room. So you do have to be very, very careful um, to tell the technologist when you get to an MRI scanner, everything that you have on you, in your pockets, um, all of that, because it will fly, it can fly right out. 
Um, obviously, because it's such a long exam and it's hard enough for us to, to stay still during all of it, it's even harder for our children to. So you certainly do need um, sedation and, and general anesthesia um, for the vast majority of these exams. We do do the feed and wraps at our institution. Some, in, some places won't try that, some places will. But, um, but only in the first couple months is that, is that feasible to get away with doing the scan. And for a face protocol scan, because it's so long, even at that, we usually can't get through all of it. Sometimes we can get the baby out and let them yell for a little bit and then feed them and then put them back in and get the rest of the study done. So sometimes we'll do that, but it's, it's tough to do. And you need the IV, which is never fun. Safety concerns for metal implants, pacemakers, anything that they've needed in the past, obviously that's always a problem. And not only is it a problem, but it causes artifacts and makes the pictures much, much less pretty for us, um, which makes it harder for us to give a good diagnosis. And braces are a nightmare. I mean, a radiologist will wake up in a cold sweat in the middle of the night, you know, <laughs> dreaming about braces, because it's, uh, it makes everything distorted. It makes you look like you're at a carnival, actually, looking through those, those kind of mirrors where everything is, makes you look like you're wider than you're tall. Um, MRI is obviously the best for soft tissues. If you think of any athlete, any soft tissue injury, even any tumor, uh, it, MRI sees it the best and really is the only option for those things. It's good for seeing blood vessels. It's much more using the high def, which seems like everybody goes to Best Buy or wherever your local uh, um, electronic store is. This, it's much more on the 720 range than it is the 1080. It's good, but it's not great. However, how good do you need it to see what you need to see? A lot of times, it's more than good enough. Most of the time, it's more than good enough to see what we need to see for the findings of face syndrome. And it's terrible for imaging bone. As you saw on the other, and you'll see here in a second, on this image, where's the bone? And it's not where the arrow is pointing to. That's pointing to the asymmetry that I was talking about before with the cerebellar hemispheres, how one is a little bit smaller than the other, and that's why there's the extra white on one side than the other. But the bone you can't even see, so it's, it's not the best for that. But the good thing is we're not worried about that in face syndrome because a lot of the findings outside of the sternal findings are not in the bone, it's in soft tissues. This is an example of an MRA, and this is the data that the computer will get in the beginning. And even on the base data, you can see very, very clearly, this is the normal appearing arteries on this side. This is the abnormal appearing arteries on this side. And you can see how, me like a meandering river, how windy they are on this side as compared to the other side. Then the computer will put it all together, just like the CT scanner does, it's the same thing. And this is what we'll get. So this is the extent of the head over here. And this is telling the computer to give us all the blood vessels inside the brain and take away everything else. And here's the normal side with the middle cerebral artery coming out and anterior cerebral artery here, the, the carotid artery right here. And this is the side that has all this extra white stuff and that's those blood vessels that are kind of turning one way, then the other, then the other. Sometimes it gets real confusing. Here's, a, here's an example where there's a lot of vessels, the computer didn't do a great job, I have an arrow, it's always helpful when an arrow, but when I get the images, there's never an arrow on them in the beginning. So, um, but how do you clean it up? And actually, the, the computer does a good job and is able to take away everything but that. And then, this being the normal side with a straight middle cerebral, straight anterior cerebral, and then you have this loop-de-loop -loop on the other side. The great thing is, is that we're doing a lot of it here, is now we have time-resolved MR angiography, which just means that when you inject the contrast, we can tell the computer to take little glimpses. It would be like if you open and close your eyes really, really quick, and then whatever you see at that moment gets put on a piece of paper. And this is the first time I'm putting a movie on, so we'll see, I guess it worked. Um, but this is what you see. And you can see how the arteries are shooting up there first. This here is the jugular vein, and this is the artery. But 
the computer will actually, you can watch the blood flow and see if it's going in the right direction. And that really gives us a lot more information than we had in the past because a movie is a lot better than a picture hanging on the wall. Angiography has been around a long time and it's certainly not like the computers we have at home or the TVs that are changing every single year, but it's the gold standard. And still today, it's the highest resolution of everything. <laughs> Not like we really always need it, but it's, it is the highest resolution. The information is obtained is similar to what I just showed you. You can actually watch as you, as you put dye in and see where it goes. So you can see if a certain finding of all these many findings we talk about with, with face syndrome, if some of these findings actually make the blood flow differently, or if the blood just has a little bit longer of a road on that side or not. And, um, and that can be very helpful information because what we we talk about physiologic information versus anatomic you have a static picture versus how the blood reacts to the different artery and the important thing is how the blood reacts a lot of times it can look funny but it functions just fine and we do have to use x-ray when we're actually taking those glimpses as we're putting in the contrast those are x-rays this is an invasive study. If any, anybody you know has had a heart catheter, it's the same thing. You stick a small needle under ultrasound guidance into the leg, and you put a small catheter up into the neck, and sometimes up to the top of the neck, and then you put the dye in on each side. So it's what we would call an invasive study. And because of that, we certainly need general anesthesia. It's very difficult if, if the child is moving around a lot, and it's also, we, we could use sedation in teenagers, but typically at our institution, we'll use general anesthesia. There's always risks and benefits whenever you're talking about any procedure, even the CT with the possibility of contrast and with the x-rays. But the risk for the angiography is additional because instead of putting the needle into a vein to eject through an IV, you're putting the needle into an artery. So that's a higher pressure system when you take the needle out there can be more bleeding if it doesn't stop. It's very rare that we have any problem with bleeding. It's usually maybe 2% uh, along that lines, but if you do, there can be more bleeding than with a vein. And then always, if you Google it, everybody you know, Googles things these days, you can always see that there's a small risk of a, of a stroke because typically most of the studies have been done with the plaques with older patients who had catheters and you can, when you, the catheter goes next to the, the carotid arteries, you can flip off a piece of the plaque that's sitting there. In babies, we don't have to worry about that. However, in babies, the arteries are very sensitive, and just like you can get a cramp in your leg, you can get a cramp in your artery too, and they can spasm, and sometimes that can cause problems. So it's a very, very small risk. It's 1% or less, but it's a risk that I always talk about with families. You'll have to go to this weird sounding area, IR, VIR, endovascular surgery, image guided therapy. Every, every uh, partner across the country calls their center something a little different, but they're, it's all radiology based or image guided. And outside of um, face syndrome, we commonly will use the angiography before we do a procedure. If, if there is, um, uh, a tumor with a lot of blood flow to it and you're going to go to surgery to really reduce the blood flow a lot after I take a picture of which arteries are feeding it I can just put blockades inside of each of those arteries and cut off the blood flow which leads to much much less blood loss for the child and a quicker recovery here is uh, a couple angiograms we'll see if this uh, movie works here this is one looking at the side, and the kind of you can get a feel for the information that you can get on this versus the information uh, that you got on the MRI. And this is actually a picture of what we call the, the Moya Moya. And here, there should be an artery going all the way back, a number of them, and you see they kind of stop right in the middle here and the classic description is a puff of smoke and this is that black area that keeps getting more and more black all the rest of these arteries are what we would see on a normal study 
So what's our approach in a minute here? Our approach is a lot of what I alluded to already. We, we have first the MRI and MRA, where we get the head, the neck. We, we now know a lot of information about what is common, what is very uncommon, what we should be looking for, what is important to look for in this syndrome. And we can get that information with the technology that we have from an MRI and an MRA in the vast, vast majority of the situations. Many times we don't have to sedate the children because um, we were looking at the average age at when a child presents and somewhere between one and two months. And a lot of times we can do the feed and wrap with that, which makes it a win-win type of a situation. If there is any question, we can move on from the MRA to the CTA. You still don't need that big invasive procedure. However, um, it's very rare these days that we need to move on. Usually the MRA is good enough to see everything that we need, and the MRI is more than good enough to see the brain imaging that we need. And then also, obviously, for the heart findings. And the ultrasound of the heart is usually always good enough to see what we need to see for the heart. Um, if there's any questions more so on any of the, the blood vessels or there's a questionable finding, then you could move on to an MR of the chest, MRA of the chest. Um, typically, with the protocols we talked about over the last couple days and, and what we would recommend is, is we can use that same MRA of the neck and just go a little bit lower and then we can see the aortic arch findings too, just like you saw on that image that I showed you where it was low enough that we could see that the backside was thin and then could properly direct for coartation repair. And this is my pediatric experience at home. And if any of you from Wisconsin have seen that, that lady there, that's, uh, she's on the adult side. She's in the neurosurgery department. That's my wife. So, And thank you very much.